So good morning, I'm Jane Field, and on behalf of the members and the board of the Maine Council of Churches, where I serve as executive director, I'd like to welcome all of you. Welcome first all of you here in person and all of you joining online. And there will be some who join us after the fact by watching the recording. This will be recorded except for the small group time and it will be posted to our YouTube channel probably by next week. We are glad that you are here, whether you're in person or online or watching a recording. First, I'd like to thank the Unitarian Universalist Church and Minister Justine, Tech Wizard Judd, for all of their hospitality, for Shirley, who works in the office. They've just been such gracious hosts to us. And this program wouldn't have been possible without the generous support of three funders who provided grants to us. The Eleanor Humes Haney Fund. Uh, I learned about Ellie Haney during our program uh, in February about the book, The Gatherings. I had never got to meet Ellie. I think, Jill, you probably did. What an amazing woman. Um, so how wonderful that uh, a fund set up in her honor is helping to fund today. Uh, right down the street, First Parish United Church of Christ here in Brunswick provided a grant for this day. And finally, the Prejudice and Poverty Program of the New England Yearly Meeting of Quakers. And Fritz is here today from that group. We thank them not only for their generosity, but also for their patience. Because we all had to wait very patiently while the COVID pandemic began to finally subside they all funded us more than two years ago to do this program, and they haven't asked for their money back, and they've been very patient, so we're grateful to them. I'd also like to thank our MCC team. You probably met Megan Akers, our office administrator and social media coordinator uh, as you came in. Pastor Christopher Gilbert, who is a member of our board and serves as our secretary, as well as the ELCA representative. He's the pastor at St. Ansgar Lutheran Church in Portland, right down the street from my house. And Ophelia Hu Kinney, who will be moderating the other, or facilitating the other small group, she is the worship coordinator at Hope Gateway, which is the newest associate member church of the Maine Council of Churches. So thank you both for being here today. There's one final word of gratitude and acknowledgement before I introduce our program and our keynote speaker respectfully, and with a mindfulness whose goal is to motivate reparative action and right relationship. Let's pause to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional land of the Pajepscot people. They were a sub-tribe of the Erosaguntacooks, who were part of the Abenaki tribe. Their descendants, now part of the Wabanaki Confederacy, are still here in the Dawnland a place we sometimes call Maine. So, five years ago, in 2017, does anyone remember what life was like in 2017? No lockdowns, no masks, no vaccines, no social distancing. Anyway, in 2017, the Board of Directors of the Maine Council of Churches, which, by the way, is an ecumenical coalition of seven Protestant denominations, two associate members, member churches, and one cooperating denomination. It's a mouthful, right, Jill? <laughs> Jill is uh, my predecessor as the executive director. She's herded these cats a lot longer than I have. <laughs> but all of these denominations represent 441 congregations with over 55,000 members all over the state. Anyway, the board of that organization made a commitment to enter into what ended up being a two-year period of in-depth study and deep personal and institutional reflection about race, privilege, and equity. At the outset, we acknowledged to each other that it wouldn't be easy, it would probably make us uncomfortable, and it would likely have an impact on the way we carried out our organization's mission to inspire people to unite in building a culture of justice, compassion, and peace. We knew that a lot of the difficulty and discomfort would be related to the fact that our board and our member denominations and churches had and still have 
mostly white folks at the table, in the pulpits, in their pews, or chairs. One of the spiritual practices that served us well throughout this time of study and reflection, and I see Cush Anthony, another board member here, he was present for this process. So if I get anything wrong, he'll, he'll let me know. But one of the spiritual practices that served our board well was making a concerted and conscious effort to listen more attentively to the voices of black, indigenous, and people of color, sometimes referred to as BIPOC. And when we did, what some of those voices were saying caused us to reconsider a program that had been a signature of MCC for more than a decade, our civil discourse initiative and our civil discourse covenant. This came as a surprise at first, since we could not imagine why a program that called on candidates and elected officials and congregations and even individuals to be civil, even when they disagreed, how could that be a problem? when it comes to racism. But when we listened, when we really listened to what BIPOC voices from the margins were saying, we realized we had to push the pause button on our civil discourse efforts until we could sort out how to adjust our approach to come into line with our commitment to being anti-racist in our work and our witness. There's a bibliography that I'll hand out at the end of today, and it will also be available online on our website, where some of the quotes I'm about to read to you come from, so that if you wanted to read articles or books in their entirety, you can. But what we read, what we heard, brought us up short. Here are some quotes. The concept of civility has been used as a tool of oppression in the United States. Civility is rooted in the notion of civilization and civilized culture, both historically used to uphold Western colonialism. The relationship between alleged civilizers and the people they're gifting with civility is inherently undemocratic, unequal, and racist. This one made a lot of sense to me. Pushing back against the status quo will be seen as inherently uncivil by the people who want to maintain the status quo. Calls for civility are calls for the quieting of the marginalized voices pushing back against an undisturbed racial hierarchy. There's been a repeated cycle of the powerful demandings of civility while acting uncivilly throughout history and even today. Whenever you introduce the language of civil versus uncivil in the political arena, you often tend to empower the very forces they want to discipline, punish, chastise, and castigate, the populations that historically have never been allowed to determine the rules of who is civil and who is not. Here's one that made me laugh, but with a wince because of the truth of it. Civility serves our current political climate as much as using the proper fork at dinner helps to eradicate global hunger. <laughs> we do great harm by asking that the most disenfranchised among us continue to turn the other cheek so that we can bear the lash from another angle again and again. This is what the United States has consistently demanded of people who have been marginalized on the basis of gender, race, national origin, sexual orientation. Articulate your concerns in tones and at times deemed appropriate by those who benefit most from your oppression. That's not civility, that's abuse. If you're stuck in a trap, you'll cry and grunt, struggling to break free Pearl clutching about civility and tone policing are tools of the privileged because one should not and cannot be civil when confronting those who willingly harm disadvantaged groups. This from an undergraduate student at Princeton University. I went there for graduate school and I can't imagine being a woman of color on that campus. If there are any tigers in the room, forgive me for trashing your alma mater, but I can't imagine it. This is what she says. The concepts of civil discourse and mutual respectability ask us to treat every idea 
as though it is worthwhile. Plainly put, this is nonsense. Some ideas are not worth discussing. The basic and fully answered question of whether or not racism is real is a distraction from talking about how to handle its innumerable impacts. This is not to say that civil discourse is entirely bankrupt. As a biographer of James Baldwin famously said, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. We can discuss many things calmly and politely. My worth isn't one of them. And no one is entitled to conversation, civility, or respect if they think otherwise. She was pretty angry. It, it was a part of an article about something that had happened to her over and over again in classrooms at the university. Remember that when white clergymen criticized demonstrators in Birmingham for disturbing the surface calm of a so-called peace, Reverend Dr. King chided them for putting manners over morality. I am sorry, he wrote from his jail cell, that your statement did not express a similar concern for the conditions that brought the demonstrations into being. Zizi Packer wrote, unlike a civility of manners, a civility of morals obligates us to interrogate what it means to keep the peace and at what cost. That's what we're going to do today. Interrogate what it means to keep the peace and at what cost. And then last June, I don't know how many of you read the Portland Press Herald, but someone I'd never heard of but should have named Todd Ricker who's a white man, he's a labor organizer. Some of you know him, I had never met him before. He wrote this letter to the editor. One of the more subtle elements of the white supremacy in which we white folks were raised is the privilege to insist on politeness from those who are screaming in pain. We have been taught that we have the right to make others be nice to us in order for them to be heard by us. We should embrace these voices, he wrote, not dismiss or silence them because they are uncomfortable for us to hear. Ooh. <laughs> All of that took the wind out of our civil discourse sails. So we began to cast about for someone who could help us and other people of faith and goodwill reframe our understanding of civility in a way that's in keeping with a commitment to anti-racism and in keeping with our faith-based values, which are rooted in Hebrew and Christian scripture. Enter the amazing Dustin Ward. <laughs> Dustin is founder and president of It Is Time LLC, a BIPOC-led organization helping Maine communities address and end systemic racism through racial equity and reconciliation advocacy. Um, he holds a BS in political science from USM and an MDiv or Master of Divinity from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. After the murder of George Floyd, and by the way, you probably know that just 20 days from now we will mark the second anniversary of that murder, Dustin left the parish ministry to begin work as a racial equity and reconciliation advocate. He's also an implicit bias educator for MindBridge a member of the board of directors of Atlantic Black Box. If you're not a member, you should be. And it was their executive director who introduced me to him. And Dustin is the first person of color to be elected a select board member of New Gloucester, Maine. It has been a privilege and a joy to work with Dustin over the past five months as we prepared for today's program. And I know that it's going to be your privilege and your joy to welcome him to this pulpit today or into your living room if you're watching online as he helps us reconsider how to develop and promote an anti-racist approach to civility and civil discourse. So please join me in welcoming Dustin Ward.
Well, good morning. I'm gonna start us off with a little story, actually. Young woman hosting a dinner party for her friends. She served a delicious pot roast. And if you've heard this story before, my apologies. But as she's serving it, one of her friends who was enjoying it walked up to her and asked her for that recipe. Young woman wrote it down for her. And upon looking at the recipe, her friend inquired, well, why do you cut both ends off the pot roast before you prepare it and put it in the pan? Young woman replied, I don't know. Cut the ends off because I learned the recipe from my mom and that's what she'd always done. So her friend's question actually got her thinking. So she called up her mom the next day and said, Mom, when, when you make the pot roast, why do you cut off and discard the ends before you set it in the pan and season it? Her mom replied quickly, that's how your grandma always did it. And I learned the recipe from her. So now the young woman is very inquisitive and she's very curious, so she called her grandma up. She said, Grandma, I often make that same pot roast of a recipe that I learned from mom and I know she learned from you. Why do you cut the ends off the pot roast before you prepare it? And grandma thought for a while, since it had been years that she'd made it, she said, you know, I cut the ends off because the roast was always bigger than the pan I had back in the day. I had to cut it off to put it in the pan. I usually tell that story, I told that story to the first clients I ever started with with this business because it's really a metaphor for today's issues. The story reminds us that we pass so much down without any context from where we get it from. When you talk about racism, We've passed down so much pain. We've passed down so much hurt. We've forgotten the systems that have actually created it, mostly by majority white men. We forgot and we've lagged in understanding the origins of enslavement and suppression. But as we talk about these tough issues, we've passed down this silence and denial as a means of engagement. We've used words like civility to accomplish this. We've forgotten the art of civil discourse and we've replaced it with assumptions and rhetoric that is disheartening. We've made peace our goal, but never action. So today I wanna to take an opportunity to maybe fix or to mend this issue. First, we gotta recognize the concept of civility. We gotta look at how it has suppressed marginalized voices. How in our attempt to be civil, we've silenced those who are fighting for their rights. Marginalized voices. And I hope we can see a moment where we can find a path forward in the wake of complex and tough issues that do need discussing. I wanted to just provide a reality for us and set the foundations so that we today will work on some solutions. Now, when I have clients and I work with them on this type of, uh, of effort, I always start with definitions because I want us to be on the same page because too often we got to break down a word so that we know what we're talking about. Too often we get caught up in the nuances of a word and we use a word and we think we know what the meaning is, but we misplace it with a much larger or grander meaning. And what I've recognized is that civility is used as a code word. It starts not with how we look at the entomology of it, but it's a misuse of how we use coded words. Let me give you some examples of coded words or coded language. These are words or phrases that have been made to mean more than they actually truly represent. They are fully loaded. First one that maybe some of you have heard that I started to hear as I entered into this DEI work, communism, communist or Marxist. It was used as a fear rhetoric. You're playing off a belief from this governing or thinking that was evil or misguided. So that anything that was wrong was labeled communist or Marxist. So every time I would teach about race in this country, oh, that's Marxist. It's coded language. Words like urban or inner city, they have been used to sort of paint, paint black communities and stereotype that, oh, that's only where black folks live, is in the urban areas or the inner city. So we create discriminatory ideas out of that. We say, oh, well, those urban areas, those are crime infested, those are drug infested. And what we end up saying is, well, it's the black communities that have the problem. Words like thug, which has even been used in the last few years in our presidential conversations. Thug has denoted a criminal, someone who has ill will, and thus I can call a whole group of people that one thing and negatively label them, but never address them. Think about the other words or phrases you may have heard over these last few years. Coded language, all lives matter. What about black on black crime? Illegals, 
migrants. Those are coded words. And what that does is it creates division. It fully discriminates and subjugates and oppresses without ever uttering a direct word to any person or any group. Folks, it's used as a weapon and it attacks the groups and people who are fighting for their own rights. Civility has fallen into that. It's a code word. It's used to minimize and actually discriminates without really discussing anything. A book by Alex Zemlin, Against Civility, the Hidden Racism and Our Obsession with Civility, he writes this, and I love this first quote I'll share with you. Civility is a central term through which racial inequality has been maintained. Civility is exalted in the language of slaveholders, segregationists, lynch mobs, and eugenicists. It's also enshrined in the language of free marketeers and preachers of fiscal responsibility. And surprisingly, it's elevated in the language of well-intentioned liberals, self-described moderates, and devout progressives. All of them traffic in ideas about public etiquette to declare what counts as a good citizenship and what doesn't. From slavery to Jim Crow to black ghettoization to mass incarceration to police brutality, the idea of civility has been enlisted to treat black suffering with apathy or to maintain an unjust status quo. Worse, it has been a tool for silencing dissent, repressing political participation, enforcing economic inequality, and justifying violence upon people of color. Whew, that's heavy. Some of y'all wish I was your pastor, huh? Folks, it's used to silence. And what it does is it desires to attach a behavior to the conversation, saying that if we talk about it, we might start to disagree, and thus we won't be acting as good citizens. So let's avoid the conversation altogether. What civility does is it causes us to run away in fear. We use it to avoid the fight because we're afraid to get our hands dirty. Because if we're uncivil, we're a little bit barbaric. Because if we fight about our differences, we act unbecoming. So if we don't talk about it, can't act up. What civility does is it silences those whom are most affected. Because the issues that most affect them become erased. Even the most egregious situations never get discussed. So this use of civility invokes this idea and forces people not to engage the problem. And those with the most marginalized feel the effects of their issues, but they're never assisted in any true way. And guess what this does? It creates a us versus them. If you continue in that book, he writes this. The idea of civility has been recruited in these ways by these figures because it provides the perfect language for creating friends and identifying enemies for dividing what is good and what is evil, legal and illegal, right and wrong. Civility avoids moral gray areas and offers something more cleanly defined about also less complex. This is suitable for those who want to demonize their opponents but also want to characterize themselves as virtuous. There's division in civility. Because it says we are the good ones, y'all are the bad ones. It creates morality out of these aspects of civility. And then it forces you to pick a side. And if you're not on my side, then you're not right. You're misguided. You're incorrect. And guess what it does? It says you're not even human. There are studies today that show in our political climate, we don't even see our other as human. And you can be disposed of at that point. That's our problem at hand. If we continue to engage in this idea of civil or civility within our politics and our social justice and even in our religion, we further alienate, we further divide, we create more hatred, and we will create greater trauma and greater pain for a next generation. I'll give you a prime example, and the best examples are always the one we live, correct? So I'll give you a life example. I did grow up in Prescott. Shout out to people from Prescott. I grew up in a church. And now, standing here before you, I realize what that's meant is, well, I know the stories. I went to church weekly. I went to the youth group on Wednesdays. I was in all the community events, and all of that was so I could be a good person. I never really engaged with the omniscient, prominent, all-powerful God. I was told, just live like Jesus, and you won't get in trouble. And my parents pushed that. And that's how Christ was sort of presented to me. That's how the gospel was sort of presented to me. And some may resonate with that. 
I grew up in an evangelical world that sort of created this narrative of saying, we don't want bad people. So we'll use church and the Bible and the community. We'll create the right people. And then I went to seminary. 2013, I heard the call. Moved away from Maine because I wanted to be better, better prepared for pastoral ministry. I wanted to be better to, equipped. So I, at that point, I did process and discuss and engage with the God of Genesis all the way to Revelation. But I was also prepared for future local ministry. And I witnessed the changing landscape, and that was where the first signs of trouble I knew were coming with this idea of civility. In my world, and maybe this wasn't yours, but in the world I was preparing in, I watched as pastors needed to begin to deal with these issues of LGBTQIA+, of women in ministry, of free will and salvation, and racism, and you could see the tension in their body, the angst that they had as we approached these conversations. We would actually get to a certain point and we would go no further. We would back off in fear of fighting. And then we'd go our separate ways and our paths in ministry. We'd never address the problem. But none became more of a reality to me than in 2020. And I'll never forget the day, June 2nd, 2020, I took a stand. I said, enough is enough. Because after the death of Mr. George Floyd, I wrote a two-page response because I felt I could not stay silent any longer. I needed to speak out. At the time, I was a senior pastor over a church in Yarmouth. I said, I want to use our platform to lead groups and these members on a journey. I want to help us all handle the right way to process it with all of these racial issues and social justice problems. So I wrote my reaction out. I said, what does it mean for all of us right now? How do we handle this moment? And I started it off with three words. It is time. What was it time for? I said, it's time that we as black and brown individuals stand up and say enough is enough. I said, it's time that there was no more police killing, no more trauma, no more discrimination. I stood up and I said, we need to take back these issues of race and racism in our nation. I said, it's time that we lead the fight for owning our own culture and not being minimized from it and in the same breath not have it stolen from us and then capitalized on for someone else's gain. I said, it's time that we improve our economic well-being and our generational wealth. I said, it's time we stop gerrymandering and give access and equity in our voting. I said, it's time for police reform and better criminal justice systems and better law enforcement. And I wrote that all in two pages. I was upset. I presented this to my ministry team. My initial thought was, ah, they're going to be on board because I wanted us to rally around this idea. I said, I want us to become the example of change. I thought, what better person and what better moment than someone coming with maturity to the table who self-identifies as a black individual who has carried this racism for so long and could carry this forward? Who else? And what I got was racist rhetoric and toxicity. And it brought back every old pain and trauma from the lives I'd lived when I was in high school and even up to that point. Team members saying, well, we don't talk about politics in church. That pastors shouldn't be discussing this issue. I was sent videos of one or two black men who were saying counter arguments to me as if they spoke for all of us. I was given messages of stereotypes and hurtful statements of which I had all heard before. If only there was fathers in the home, if only people weren't on welfare, I heard it all. And this was all from my own church community, not to mention the people outside of that that were saying the same thing. At that moment, I realized I was done with ministry. I put seven years into it, and I preached my last sermon on July 12th, 2020, and I never looked back. And I tell you that because I want to show you what civility has done. It's a simple story that exemplifies the issues that we're dealing with here today. In an effort to be civil and not deal with it, we've created more harm and more trauma. Civility creates that harm and that trauma more than it does good. And let me explain why. And if we can deal with the why, then we can deal with some solutions. First off, Civility tells us that we can't be angry. And I hope you all know you can be angry. You see, it says that anger is negative. That feeling angry and upset about issues is uncivilized. 
Worse yet, it tells black and brown individuals, you can't be angry at all. You see, it discriminates the anger. As a black man and a black individual, I'm seen negatively because I'm upset. And maybe you're uncomfortable watching me get upset now. But for me, watching the death of black and brown individuals on my social media and on my TV gets me upset. Yet, I'm supposed to believe that anger is justified when it's taken against government officials and political leaders as I watch white individuals storm the Capitol. Folks, that's hard to process as a black man because the church for me was not a safe space to acknowledge that. All in the name of being civil. Civility has caused us to not be able to fight for our rights. As black and brown individuals, we've been diminished from speaking on our rights. Yet I watch white individuals who become leaders and organizers who lead causes that don't directly affect them at all. And what it does is it protects this white privilege. Civility becomes a veil of privilege that was built into this nation and this system which was based on racial inequity. And by protecting white individuals, it says, you can be outraged and upset whenever you want and you can step away from the issues whenever you feel like it. I wake up black every day. What civility has done has caused us to not process our true emotion. We're afraid to be pained. So when issues of social justice become present, we're afraid to be emotional. We can't be seen as erratic or unhinged. That's dangerous. Let me put it to you like this. It causes us to not feel like we can fully grieve. Maybe many of you know how to personally grieve a loss, but do you truly grieve when you see black and brown individuals dying? Do you truly grieve when you witness marginalized voices being beaten and marred? Do you truly grieve at the injustice within systems in this country, which is education and housing and criminal justice and all the rest? By not grieving, don't we dismiss the humanity We dismiss the feelings of people and persons who are claiming discrimination. We've said things like, oh, it's not that bad. Things have gotten better since the civil rights movement. Why is it always gotta be about race? Folks, we deny humanity with these statements. Through attempts to be civil and not deal with it, we actually dehumanize marginalized voices. Thus, our diverse communities aren't even allowed to feel we become other, we become them. In fact, we've been called rioters and looters and thugs. We are made to be nothing in an attempt to not deal with the problem. And folks, it's made us inactive. And I think that's the biggest problem. See, we'll only take action if it won't cause any problems, but we'll stop short of addressing any roots of pain and trauma that happen and take no action, whether it's trans community individuals who are looking for the affirmation and the support as they boldly and proudly proclaim themselves to the world, whether it's LGBTQIA individuals who are fighting to be heard and fighting to claim their rights, whether it's black and brown individuals who are witnessing the distress of hurtful and racist rhetoric taken against them both subtly and covertly, whether it's our Asian populations who are feeling the retribution of hatred in this country, civility has caused us to go quiet. And we've stepped away from doing anything to assist these communities. We've made inaction a possibility because we've remained civil and silent. And we've caused other communities to go fight for themselves as a room full of people begin to shy away because it's uncomfortable. Civility has pushed this desire to control the narrative. It reminds me of the book of Jeremiah. I'll finish with this. I'm reminded of those people of Israel, those people of God. They had one task, obey Yahweh, obey their God. And what did they decide to do? Rather than follow God's way, they said, I'll do it my own way. I think we got it. And what did it do? It led them astray, led them to captivity. In fact, they wouldn't see the presence of God until he would show up 400 some odd years later in the form of Christ. That desire for the self says, I'll control the narrative. How do we control what we want. And by doing that, it silences everything else, even God. 
So when we talk racial equity, when we can want to control the narrative of racial equity, we say, well, I want you to say what I want you to say. It's on me for you to say what it is. And thus it silences the victims of oppression. There's this desire for unity in just this idea of civility, and it silences any opposing ideas. But it's interesting to me because God isn't one who establishes just one of some things. There are 12 tribes of Judah. Seven is the number of completion. Three is a triune number. Ten is a legal number for ten commandments. God's world normalizes diversity. And what he asks is the people of God to help the other people that God has created. So what do we do with all this issue of civility? And here's the fun part. I usually give a bunch of solutions and get people with a lot of hope and send you all out of here feeling good. But luckily, we carved out some time for us to tackle this problem together. Usually, I do like to provide solutions and say there is hope. But today, we've created a space to commit to some action, to talk about it, to process it, and to step out of this world of civility. The solution requires us to do a few things. And in your breakout groups, that is exactly what we're going to do. Here's some advice as you go into those, and then we will respond and report out about the solutions that we have. First off, we've got to process and talk about it. I'm sorry, you're going to have to talk about it. That's the point. You need to be open and honest about it. You can't hide away. We need to begin to recognize other people's humanity as we talk to them about these issues. We need to be able to sit with our feelings, embrace the anger, embrace your hurt, embrace your joy, embrace your happiness. Those are real good, positive emotions. And hopefully we have great facilitators who will help you find the support in that pain or in that joy or in that happiness. Because what this leads to is for us to heal. We go from civility to truly healing and helping one another. And we can find action in that discussion. So indeed, it is time. We need to step away from this idea of let's just keep the peace to let's take some action as we embrace hard truth and hard conversations. And if I was in the pulpit, I'd say amen. amen. Thank you. <laughs> I told you you'd be glad you came, but that it won't be easy and you'll probably be uncomfortable. But toward being comfortable, we are going to give you a five-minute break to stretch, move around a bit, and then um, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. So we're going to put 10 of you in a small group led by Pastor Christopher up in the corner near where he's sitting. Um, and I'll kind of give a shout out when the five minutes is up, and so will he. And same goes for Ophelia. We're going to invite, um, and I'll count you off in a second, the other 10 of you to gather with her kind of back over in that corner. Um, we've been given permission by the folks, good folks here at UUCB that you can move some chairs around into a circle so that you can see one another and hear one another. Just try to put them back basically in the same spot they were in um, when you began so that when uh, their custodian resets for worship, that's easier. Um, if you're joining us online, I know this is a little bit complicated, but you're going to navigate to a new window. You're going to leave YouTube open because it will continue to stream just with the audio off. And you're going to click the Zoom link that you were sent in the um, reminder email so that you'll enter a Zoom room hosted by me and by Dustin. And we'll divide you into two groups, and you'll have your small group experience in a Zoom room. It'll be about 40 minutes that we'll be together and then we will call you back here. Um, if you're in person, we'll, call, we'll tell you in the Zoom rooms to come back to the YouTube stream to watch for the debrief. Um, Ophelia and Christopher will be given a chance after we reconvene to give some highlights and a little sharing and a debrief of what you talked about in your small group. But what we did um, talk about, the three of us, um, last night and this morning, and I need to grab my phone because I wrote it down, is some ground rules, and Dustin already gave you some of those that were the most important. But we'd like you to know that um, 
you should respect confidentiality. So, you know, it's, Brunswick's like Vegas. What stayed here, you know, what's said here stays here. Um, I bet nobody has ever said that Brunswick is like Vegas before. <laughs> <clears throat> In any event, um, there may be occasions that a learning or something you'd like to carry back to your own community of spiritual practice could be shared, but with de-identified. I didn't come up with a better word either, but um, so that nobody would know, like, well, that was Fritz who said that, or that was Kush who said that, you know, you know what I mean. Um, we want you to access your own curiosity um, and approach this in a spirit of humility and make room for others in every sense of that word so that um, you can be uncomfortable and you can talk about it, and you can step outside that world that was just described to you in that powerful message and look for a new way that doesn't harm and that makes progress toward creating a world where um, it, it sounds, especially these days, like a Pollyannish thing to say, but where the harm that racism, both systemic and personal, perpetrates every minute of every day can be stopped, at least be limited, um, that things can be better. Um, I think that's everything you need to know besides which small group you'll be in. If you're watching the recording, there was something I wanted to tell you. It's weird to be talking to people who aren't even here, but if you're watching the recording, you will see on the screen the questions that our small groups are going to be talking about for the next 40 minutes. The uh, weirdness of YouTube is that we can't edit the video, so you should feel free after you've read those questions to fast forward 40 minutes or so so that you come back into the recording at the time we reconvene. So there'll be a five minute break, but right now Ophelia is going to meet in that back corner. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> you all go with her, and this is not. Uh, back, um, yes, thank you, <laughs> exactly. Um, everyone else will be with Christopher in five minutes up here. Folks online, you'll be joining Dustin and me in a Zoom room in five minutes. Thank you.
Many thanks to Christopher and to Ophelia and to Dustin, who facilitated that time uh, in small group discussion. And they're going to share some highlights and some reflection about that time before we close. And you all can sort out who goes first. <laughs> you may need a first. break for a minute. So. No, All right, good afternoon, friends. My name is Ophelia Hukini. Uh, I'm coming in from Scarborough. And hello to everyone who is joining online or watching after the fact. All right, we had some robust discussion in our group, but I'll be honest, 40 minutes went by really, really fast. <laughs> um, I felt like we probably could have taken up 40, times, 40 minutes just getting to know each other. Um, when we started to talk about what had made us angry, what started to come together was the sense that what often made the people in our group angry was incivility, particularly when it came with a side dish of an abuse of power or bullying. Um, civility often seemed to us like it was a, it was a matter of a power dynamic. Um, so we were very cognizant of the fact that sometimes our anger stemmed from the fact that people were abusing power. Um, one of our members in our group also wanted to point us back to where the um, discussions about civility came from in the first place, which absolutely had to do with an abuse of power. Um, at the time, a bunch of gubernatorial candidates were running for governor in Maine, and a particular candidate was unwilling to sign a document saying that he was willing to abide by civil um, standards of discourse. That person then went on to become a very belligerent and uncivil governor. And with that, I just wanted to say that was an abuse of power. Um, it was not simply a, f a fact that you know, folks were unwilling to engage by particular standards of conduct. Um, some additional things that we found anchoring were hopelessness and despair and generally the system. When we feel like we are railing against a system that is set up for the failure of some and we, there is so little that we can do um, to, to fight against that. In our group, we also worried that anger can sever relationships or make us lose control. And um, we felt anger when we observed fellows with similar privileges who choose not to act in light of information that is shared um, and that could help to foment more equality. We wanted to use anger as fuel for action, and we also knew that anger pointed at something. It's an alarm, so we wanted to interrogate that. What is that anger telling us? In response to question two, we wanted to see examples of organizations and churches that are doing justice work without partisanship. Um, so, of course, there are only so many things that you can say as a church uh, without becoming partisan in nature. Um, but we wanted to make sure that there was um, a sense that while we knew there was no way to escape the very political nature of justice-seeking work, we didn't want to become innately partisan in doing that. One of the roadblocks that we experienced in um, tackling injustice and anti-racism in particular um, in our communities was impatience. And sometimes we felt afraid to grapple with grief, especially in these last few years. We knew that a lot of people in our congregations are experiencing um, a lot right now and we are in survival mode. So how do we make room for the very real grief that people are experiencing um, while we continue to make progress together? Sometimes in survival mode, we recognize that all we can do is be polite with each other because it feels too real to try to go to that next step and to really be in healing relationship with one another. And then we also named that there was an assumed normalization of some Christian doctrines and social values that make it really hard for us to break through that eggshell that says this is how Christians should be. Um, in response to question three, uh, which led us to action, man, I wish this were like a whole day instead of <laughs> 40 minutes, but here's what we came up with in a few minutes. 
Um, we wanted to applaud the Maine Council of Churches, its member congregations and denominations for being on the train track and trying to get this um, justice work headed in the right direction, acknowledging that you have done a lot of long-standing work and you are continually interrogating um, your intentions, your values, your commitments, so we did want to make note of that. Um, one of our members wanted to seek common ground with people, especially when we do have the privilege to do so, and we wanted to name that um, sometimes it does take privilege to be able to be in that place of seeking um, common ground. As Dustin had said earlier, or had alluded to earlier, it is not always safe to seek common ground with people who are actively trying to oppress you or kick you out, push you out of um, the positions you're in. Um, we also recognize that anger comes from pain. When we acknowledge that other people who are experiencing oppression, that we may or may not have anything um, explicitly to do with, but we are a witness to. Um, we invite each other to um, continually return to that truth. Where does that pain come from and how is that expressed through anger? We know that anger is a sign that we know that things can be different. So when you are angry, when you are feeling indignant, that is a sign from your, um, from your core that thing, you know that things can be different, things ought to be different. So when you are experiencing someone else's anger, um, we invite you to, um, to view their anger as such, um, an invitation to see things differently, to recognize that a different way is possible. Um, we also knew that we could be witnesses to other people's pain. Um, so rather than jump quickly to solutions, um, sit with people in that discomfort and the pain in which, to which you are invited. And I know that that feels very kind of touchy-feely and doesn't necessarily get at, you know, these are some legislative solutions, but by and large, so many of the anger, um, the things that cause us anger and pain are personal matters that then become or are um, a result of um, legislative or systemic injustice. And then lastly, we wanted to invite each other to put aside the solutions to which we come um, to our siblings' problems and oppressions and say that sometimes we think, oh, there is a, um, there is a way that has worked um, to solve this problem in my community or that I know from the privileges that I embody, but perhaps the people experiencing or at the epicenter of this pain have a lot to teach me about solutions we can enact together. So I know there's still so much untapped wisdom from the group um, that I got to be a part of, but that's where we started in these last 40 minutes. Thanks. What Ophelia said, thank you, yes. <laughs> Hi everyone, and thanks to the group I helped facilitate. Um, it was wonderful to be in community with you, and hi to the folks online too. So we as well began with a question of what makes us angry, and I think not unexpected, uh, more than one person in our group um, sort of tapped into, based on their own identities, what's happening right now in our country around sort of the, um, the legislation of bodies and specifically the legislation of women and what they can and can't do um, with their own bodies. And, and from that place also, in relationship to um, new Mainers and immigrants to Maine. This notion of the appeal to conformity, whatever that might be, um, the established rules of a place and how people have to behave in a certain way um, to be part of that particular thing was certainly that came up. Um, anger about, about uh, just the fact of needing or wanting to do something about what's happening and feeling the constraints of an appeal to being a good person or a civil person brought up anger for folks. In one case, uh, very specifically, the idea of, of the pride a particular faith community might have in the work they have done in the past or sort of in, in the immediate present that you know, that we sort of, we've got to figure it out. We have, we, we've dealt with this issue before and, and we've been such a voice for things like um, anti-oppression or anti-racism um, 
racism or whatever it might be and how that can impact the ability to move forward and to be uncomfortable in, in the particular uh, quest um, specific to, to the anti-racism journey. The way, anger about the ways and sort of the unspoken ways in which civility is maintained in, in the idea that when you go to say the state house here or any particular city, you more often than not are surrounded by paintings of white cisgendered men. And if you don't happen to be a white cisgendered man and, and have that as your agenda, then like the, the environment is telling you like behave, you know, don't, don't speak out. Only these folks have something to say. Anger, uh, we, we talked a little bit about the notion of code words and one that does get thrown around, the angry liberal, how just that label can shut down and disarms the impetus to speak out. And then moving into the notion of in the community level, you know, where we see this, um, how it's manifest and how we either participate in it or do things to help sort of unpack it or, or disarm it is the way in which, uh, I'll use the term church or worship or faith silences. We actually have silence more often than not in our, in our various practices and how just that fact can, can maintain this is the way things are supposed to be. One thing uh, th that was a, a real aha for me personally was this notion that w worship is a place for comfort. We get it and we give it. And, and to do something uncomfortable is antithetical to why we gather together in community. And, and, you know, and certainly within the notion of what happens in our, our various spaces, the, the socialization to not make folks uncomfortable. It's something we don't do, we don't push. And if you are at a community that does do some sort of active justice, it's always sort of like on the side menu. Like, this is what we do, and if you wanna be in the march, if you, you know, there's never a sense that it's integral to what we do in our communities of faith. And then turning to the question of action, how we can move into it. And for us, it was really that how, because a lot of what we talked about center on the notion of comfort, how do we create an environment of discomfort or how do we instigate that in our spaces? You know, one thing that was clear and one person shared is that if you have the anger and you can express it within your community and then let it lead you into action. For example, you know, a lot of the, um, the work around LD 1626 and the idea of really wanting to be there for our Wabanaki siblings and the anger about what has been done to them and what they do not have and to let that drive you into actually calling a senator or writing a letter. We also, two, uh, two last things about action. What if we practiced the naming of anger like we practice the naming of gratitude that we often do in our spaces? You know, we go around and say, what are you grateful for today? What if we said, what are you angry about today? Or what are you passionate about today? Um, how do, what do we normalize that instead of normalizing the, we, you know, we, we have to be nice, we have to be good. And then this one, which is, it really got me, thinking about discomfort as a sacrament. Um, it's a worshipful thing that we do. We really lift it up and honor it. I think that would be a beautiful way um, to, to, as someone else said earlier in our conversation, to help us reframe anger as love and the emotions behind anger and what we do with our anger as the most loving action we might provide to our neighbors. I think that was everything. Group, anything I forgot? Okay, good. Thank you all. I gotta say, I am, it's a good word, not humbled, but I'm so comforted by how vulnerable you all are in your groups after hearing um, both presentations. 
Um, so first, thank you to everybody here who was willing to open, be honest, and share. I think by hearing one another in that, that is powerful. Uh, for the group that was online, um, some of the similar things came up. And I think the reality that we all have had anger that needed to be processed today is good and that it can continue. Much of what we talked about was there are so many restrictions and limitations that it's frustrating. I had one member who actually is on a DEI committee and there's even restrictions there because it's built into the local politics system. Well, of course there's gonna be restrictions. So it makes it hard to do any good work. We talked about power and privilege, how that absolutely exists as you heard multiple times, even this week we're seeing it come up and one member said it's a history of where we think we've gotten past it and here it rears its ugly head. And so that continues on and we're frustrated with that. One member talked about the lack of exposure being frustrated, how there's not this ability to have an interaction with someone from a diverse background. And I thought it was a great thing to ask because they asked the question, why don't I have exposure in our church and in my church? I said, well, let's ask that question, why not? And we did acknowledge that the pandemic had this limitation, but as you heard as well, when you walk into a space that has a white Jesus and white iconography and white this and white that, you are absolutely going to feel discomfort before you even hit the pew or the chair. And maybe we need to address that. One uh, individual said, you know, it's important to make space for other cultures to lead in your worship and in your church. And I think one uh, member said that that's something that they're going to do. They have an African pastor who will be able to possibly lead worship. And I think that's a great way to, to revert that question. Why is there no exposure? Where have we let black and brown individuals lead in our services? Have they been key members of how we think about what we express in our worship and our time together? And so then we ask the question, well, what does it look like to do more? What are some solutions? One individual said, well, I'm going to join the board of trustees. And I said, that's it. Become a voice in the decision-making process. And are we creating space for other individuals who have diverse backgrounds to be voices in the decision-making process? Many of you, are you in those legislative bodies who we just said are probably some of the most restrictive and ca causing the most problems? We talked about walking our neighborhood. How do you build a relationship? Not just say, hey, come to church and never speak to them again, but truly build a relationship. Build that trust into that. We talked about the symbolism that can disconnect people very much to not just a white Jesus that gets portrayed, but reassessing our practices and our symbols that are so integrated into just whiteness. Talk about decolonizing, which is a very heavy word, but in doing decolonizing work, how do we stay in that conversation? How do we create some concrete ways of moving that conversation forward even when we get stuck? And then we talked about how do you take action? But how do you take small action? And I love the idea of even just a small step can be powerful. And so we talked about, and I would advise, celebrate your victories. When you do take those small steps, and we talked about it in our group, celebrate that and move and take another step. We talked about being available, being present for people, being present for black and brown individuals, inviting them into your home and you being invited into theirs, sharing cultural connection and breaking bread together. And we talked about how do you just answer that small call? We had a story about how someone just replied to a post on Facebook and now their relational aspect and their connections have grown. These are just some of the things that we talked about, but I must say um, everything that's been expressed here is so powerfully engaging and important for us to move this conversation forward. I hope you take bits and pieces of it and go back out into your spheres of influence and begin to truly take that action. So thank you, and thank you to our facilitators as well. Um, before I forget, because I have a scatterbrain, um, if you are interested in uh, decentering whiteness in your worship space, um, talk to Christopher. <laughs> um, they gave up centering whiteness for Lent at his church this year. Every hymn, every prayer, every image of Christ was non-white for 40 days. And again, that's, you know, that's not a giant step, but in some ways it's a giant step. 
Um, so talk to Christopher afterwards if you're interested in finding out how they did that. I got that right, didn't I? That's what you guys did. We did. We didn't do all. I think you might actually think based on someone else. The we, guy in Chicago. Did some of that, yeah. They did some of that. We and there's a guy in Chicago. And we did. Um, oh, right. Lectionary events. Yeah. yeah, lectionary and visuals. And then a guy in Chicago also did it. And I'm super sure that's very helpful to you as you go try to find the guy in Chicago who did that. <laughs> um, Alan knows who the guy in Chicago is. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm giving Christopher um, credit for, <laughs> for something that happened in the Midwest, but, um, but they did do some of that work at St. Ansgar, and it's really exciting. So to close today, and honest to God, I wrote this last night, because I'm a Saturday night preacher, sermon writer, um, and this, we, I didn't know what anybody was going to say before today. Um, but in my tradition, which is Presbyterian, worship services end with a charge and then a benediction. So the charge is meant to inspire action based on what was done and said during your time together. So think of it kind of like a commander saying to troops, charge, you know, like go, go. And a benediction, which literally in Latin means to say well wishes, comes after as a blessing to send folks on their way. So I'll give you a charge first. Go now into the world in peace and strive to learn the language of the heart. Bear witness to what you have learned here today. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable as you seek to listen to and center voices from the margins. Know that you'll make mistakes, be not afraid, and keep on trying anyway. And now for well wishes, and this is based on a pretty familiar Franciscan blessing. May God bless you with discomfort. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers at half-truths and superficial relationships so that you will live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger. May God bless you with anger. Anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you will work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, injustice, starvation, and war, so that you'll reach out your hands to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe we can make a difference in the world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done. May this be so. Amen. And thank you all for coming, but most especially Dustin, thank you. Thank you. Safe travels and be well. And uh, this will be available if you want to um, see or hear the message again. I would say by the end of next week, you should be able to, and you'll get a link by email when it does. Thank you.